But after all, his first Jenny was dead, and he had begun to call me Jenny. She spelled her name with the J E N N Y, and mine was G I N N Y, although I formerly I always went by Virginia. But it was that special connection. And I just, you know, I really was devoted to him. I was very sad when he died. And now, he was fairly young when he died. Wasn't well, I can't think. Let's see. It, it must have been, my book came out in 19. 75, it had to have been in 79, 80, somewhere, 81. And he was born in 19, let's see, Carson was born in 1917. He was born in 1920, 1919, perhaps. And so he was, he was not an old man, mm -hmm. but very, very dear. Was he, uh, since you brought Lamar up first, uh, he and Rita, uh, even, even though Rita is a well known to have uh, become an alcoholic and then cleaned herself up through Alcoholics mm -hmm. Anonymous and was very proud of that and lived happily the rest of her life mm -hmm. sober, I mean, was Lamar an abuser too? Or did you... um, I remember that we drank wine and he had a huge, he had a gallon jug of wine. And I really didn't drink, but I drank a little bit of wine with him. And I remember asking Lamar when his wife was out of the room, this is dissertation research. And I said, Lamar, I was, you know, really curious about, remember when your mother went off to, uh, with pot liquor and cooked up a great mess of turnip grains for Carson when she was sick and in the hospital? He said, oh, yes. Um, I said, well, what was wrong with Carson? And, and I said, did she, was she pregnant? Did she have a miscarriage? He said, oh, yes. And at that point, his wife came in, and she said, what are you talking about? What do you mean, a miscarriage? It was the first she had ever heard that Carson had been pregnant and that she had a miscarriage. And it was a medical abortion. I don't think we should call it a miscarriage, but it was determined by the doctors that she could not carry a child to, to a baby to, to full term. But that's how private they were, is, you know, they hadn't told. He hadn't told his wife that Carson was pregnant. So I found that, you know, that there was a reluctance, naturally, for some people to, to talk to me. Uh, although, overall, I'd say fewer than five people in all did not talk to me for the biography. One, of course, was Carson's friend and, and doctor for a time, uh, Mary Mercer. Uh, Rita had agreed to meet with me. In fact, Rita and, uh, and let's see, it was going to be a friend of Rita's uh, we're going to come to a man named Robert Mark's home. I was interviewing Robert and Hilda, his wife, from South Carolina. And and Robert said, oh, I'm so excited. He said, because uh, Rita is coming, and, um, and you'll get to meet her. And I know that she's going to like you, because by this time I knew Robert rather well. Well, unfortunately, that didn't happen, because Tennessee Williams, who was in... New York at the time called me and he said, Virginia, oh, I know Rita was going to bring Florrie Lasky. And Tennessee was not fond of Florrie Lasky. And, and he said, and he called me and he said, Virginia, you cannot meet with Rita and Florrie Lasky in the home of Robert and, and, uh, and his wife, Robert and Hilda. He said, I'm going to call Rita and tell her that she must leave. Well, actually, what he said was, leave that bitch at home, but, you know, he said, I'm going to ask her not to bring Floria. Well, he said, but I don't have Rita's telephone number. Do you have it? Well, I would gotten her phone number from Pancho Rodriguez, Tennessee's friend in New Orleans, and he was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and so was Rita. And he said, I've got the phone number. I'd be happy to give it to you. So I had Rita's phone number. I gave it to Tennessee Williams. She was furious that he had called her. How dare you call me on my unlisted phone number? How did you know how to get me? And he said, well, Virginia, Spencer Carr gave it to me when she said that she was going to meet you, and I wanted to advise you, da dum da dum Well, Rita said, I'm just not going to go. We're not going to go. So Robert Mark said, I'm afraid I've really cleared your deal because they're not coming. It was only later that I met Rita because um, she did agree to to meet me with Robbie Lance 
and Floria Lasky at the Russian Tea Room. And, and Rita had a friend of hers uh, with her from Macon. And I had the publisher with me who was going to publish the book back when it was a bibliography with a short introduction. And um, I remember I got there just after Robbie Lance did, and he was very friendly, and I liked him so much. And, and then other people came, and then Floria came, and I remember her sliding into the booth and throwing her purse along the booth, uh, the seat, and saying, well, I must say, Mrs. Carr, that you're one hell of a persistent female. And I said, thank you. And then we talked, and we got along very well. But they explained in no uncertain terms that they could not cooperate with me in the biography, that they did not want anyone to write it for 25 years after all the principals were dead. Now later they did approach me when it seemed like the biography would be written <laughs> with or without their cooperation. And I was asked if I would take on a named co-author whose reputation would carry the book and I would be more the silent researcher and writer because they had heard that I was having great success with people talking to me. And that very day that that approach was made, I, I thanked, uh, and I suppose it must have been, it must have been that Russian Tea Room date. And I said, thank you so much, but this morning I met with Kim McCormick, my editor at Doubleday, and signed the contract to write the book alone. And so that, you know, that was both my launching and, you know, my withdrawal, too, in terms of some of the accessibility that I'd hoped to have. But obviously they didn't make the phone calls to tell people not to speak to you. No, Robbie Lance did write me a letter, though, and he said that we're asking everyone who knew Carson not to talk with you, but to save their material for the authorized biographer. And of course, and that was even before, I mean, that was before uh, we met in person. Okay, but after they met you, they, they didn't st try to stop you legally or... Well, they did uh, try to stop me to the degree that I was denied permission to quote from Carson's unpublished works. And then as sort of a final, you know, <laughs> stomping in, uh, I heard from Houghton Mifflin, who had been Carson's publisher for all of her books, that they had been advised not to give me permission to quote from, from the published works. And they thought that surely that would stop the book, because at that point I had written a great deal of the biography. And um, there was a telegram from Ken McCormick telling me that Houghton Mifflin had sent this wire to them, and then Two hours later, a telegram came from, I don't recall now whether it was from Houghton Mifflin directly or from Ken McCormick at Doubleday, but they rescinded that and they said, of course, Mrs. Carr may quote from the published works. And we've been told that she does not have permission to quote from the unpublished works. So I was very careful in my um, paraphrasing and my um, putting into my own words, and actually I think it made a better book because I did not have permission to quote from the works. Because um, it was really mine, it wasn't, this is what, you know, it wasn't a lead-in and then the quote and then my comment upon the quotation, it was all of mine. And, and apparently, and I never heard any rumbling after the book was published that I had misused my material. There was never a threat of a lawsuit. Oh, except from Truman Capote, uh, who threatened to sue me. Uh, this is before the book came out. If I linked his name with Newton Arvin, and I had done a, lot, a great deal of research at Northampton and knew about Capote's friendship, intimate friendship with Newton Arvin, a professor of English there. And, um, and so what I did is I just withdrew, you know, any explicit linking that I had. I had a couple of, um, couple of little warnings like that. I remember Jose Quintero, who directed the first run of The Servant of Wonderful, uh, was not a happy camper at that point because he was very much consumed by alcohol. And uh, 
And I had talked with Ann Baxter, who told me the whole story, Ann being the star, the star of the Square Root of Wonderful. And, and she, you know, told me what, how outrageously Quintero left, left the show, and even Carson got on stage and said, I've, I've never directed a play, but I wrote this play, and if you'll stay with me, I can direct you. And they all agreed to stay. And then a new, uh, George Keithley, a new director, was, was found, and the show opened, of course, fine. Well, because I had quoted Ann Baxter, I did have uh, the lawyer of, of Doubleday, and they find tooth comb, everything, uh, said, you're going to have to get Contreras permission to make these allegations about his leaving the show and why. And um, so Kim McCormick sent all the pages that dealt with Quintero to him, and he just wrote in the margins in several places. He said, Virginia Spencer Carr has my permission to say anything she wants about me. He signed it, Jose Quintero. And then I met him in person later, down in Columbus, when we did a play, a, an O'Neill play down there. And he said, I like your book. So it's been a, you know, it's been a, a living experience to be the biographer of Carson McCullers, and I have treasured that. That's been another joy, is to be able to, to have Jordan Massey as my dear friend after all these years, and to David Diamond to be able to pick up the phone and talk to him, and we do talk fairly often. Um, I, I consider myself very fortunate that these folks were forthcoming to me, and, and I remember I interviewed Janet Flanner down in the New Yorker office, and and she was pretty old by this time. And, but there were several key people I hadn't gotten to. And, and when Janet Flanner agreed to talk with me, well, first, before she agreed to talk with me, her companion, Natalie, Bar Natalie Murray, uh, I interviewed. And Miss Murray interrupted the interview. And she said, excuse me, I have to call Janet, or Jeanne. Um, and so she did. And she said, you'll want to talk to Virginia. And so it was, and, and then here's the phone number. Uh, she'll be expecting your call this afternoon. So when I talked with Janet Flanner, it was just wonderful. And I remember saying, now, I'm certainly going to send you a copy of the book. Oh, don't do that. I buy my book. She said, you've got more important people to send them. I mean, I was just touched by that. But the story that Janet Flanner told me that I thought was so touching was uh, when Reeves, as she said, uh, just before he died, I called her and asked her to come over, and and she couldn't, and and she he sent her flowers, and he said, I, I believe as I recall, she said that that she received three great bouquets, and the last bouquet, she said was so large I could hardly get my arms around it, and naturally I looked quickly at the card, and it said from the man across the sticks, and it was Reeves delivered after he had died, after he had killed himself. So, you know, and people who share are so touched that in a way it's really reliving the good things. And and who knows, I made, you know, I was so sensitive to Carson's, I thought, who she was and, and her needs and her giving nature. And there was a, a, a lovely giving nature to Carson. There was also, you know, they were all sides. She was multi-complex. But it was, I mean, I think she affected my life, and I became more than I had been before, more sensitive, I'm sure. So thanks for giving me this chance to talk about Carson and Reeves. And do you know the picture that I used in my biography of, of, of Carson with George Davis? They're lying out on the lawn, you know, on beside the, the one river. My, one of my he favorite. gave me that photograph just outright. He's, it's yours, Mrs. Carr. I would, and we never met in person. Will you please give him my best, best wishes? I will. Envy your meeting him. Well, he's canceled on me twice. Uh, <laughs> but I've gone to Paris twice for other reasons, and, then, and he knew that. Mm -hmm. And so this is the first time I've gone to actually specifically to see him, so I'm going to guilt trip into him right. into actually meeting with me. Because at, for a famed photographer, he hates to be photographed, and he hates to be filmed. <laughs> <laughs> but he's going to do this for Carson. 
Good. Yeah. You know, Carlos Dews, whom I got to know while he was still writing the doctoral dissertation, uh, his his recreation of Illuminations and Night Glare. Um, with Carlos, it, it's been just so warm, and, and because he's such a generous, spirited person too. But you know, we—I think that's the joy—is that we've all shared. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember now. I was going to tell you something that I thought was real special when I brought up Carlos, but it has flown out the door. As it does with our conversation. Yes. yes. Um, the uh, one thing I want to—I'm going to skip around a little bit, okay. if you don't mind. Uh, you brought up the fact that Janet Flanner told you about Reeves sending her the bouquet. Mm -hmm. uh, and correct me if this came, this could have come from your book, but, but you do, didn't know that she kept him, kept Reeves alive the last three months of his life. I do, I do know did that. Did she tell you that or did someone else tell you that? It could have been Natalie Murray who may have commented on, on that. I just don't know. Janet was very forthcoming and, uh, and I can, obviously everything that I learned in these interviews didn't go into the book, but all of my materials that are both uh, oral interviews that I took on tape and then my notes, all of that has gone to, to Duke University, to the archives, and the McCullers slash car archives are available for anyone's use. And, and that's that's been the joy. I think they must have the original draft of the biography too, which was much longer than what got published. And um, and things that that I wrote and then tucked away and never saw again once the materials went. I had to make room for Dos Passos, my next biographical project, and someone drove down uh, from the university and you know went to the grocery store and brought cardboard boxes into my house and you know and, and loaded it up right then. And I just said you know goodbye. I remember it was uh, inauguration day and I was watching. Must have been 1980, so no, 78, 79, and we loaded up everything. Well, let's talk about that because that's uh, you just took some words out of my mouth uh, later on down the line because so many people that have become connected to Carson later in life, writers, song, uh, songwriters, uh, Nancy Griffith, Josiane Savignon, the French biographer, uh, Nancy, Nancy, and Suzanne Vega. They all said that at some point they had to put Carson away because it started to consume them. Did you want to get rid of this material because of it consuming you? No, not really. By then I'd gone through a divorce, you know, my husband having said uh, that uh, he wanted a divorce if I were to write another book, and I assured him I would write another book, but I would wait for a year and to let my pores fill up. And so I was already under contract for the Dos Passos biography when I thought, where am I going to put these materials? It was with great reluctance, except that I got a nice, you know, um, I don't, don't know quite what to call it. I got some good money from, from a stipend, a stipend. Uh, and, and that helped because I had to stake more of my research. It took, you know, a very short time to go through the first advance for Dos Passos. And so it was with mixed feelings. Of course, now I have to decide what to do with my Paul Bowles materials now that I'm about ready to go to press with him and and make room for my next subject. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a it's a hanging on to emotionally, but also it's a letting it get out there because somebody's gonna want to read, for example, my Paul Bowles thirteen hundred page manuscript, just simply from a scholar's point of view to see how I documented and what got left out in the various versions as I whittled it down.